Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to start. Uh, so good evening and uh, welcome to today's uh, theoretically speaking uh, talk on what do the theory of computing and movies have in common? I think you are the answer. Um, anyway, my, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> My, uh, uh, I'm Shafi Goldwasser. I'm the director of the Simons uh, Institute for the Theory of Computing. And just a few words about the Simons Institute. Uh, we're an international venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. We were established in 2012 uh, with a very generous grant from the Simons Foundation. And our mission is to bring together world's leading researchers in theoretical computer science and related fields. And with particular emphasis on the next generation of outstanding young scholars, postdoc students, to explore sort of laws of computation and the use of algorithms in science, exact, life, social, and engineering. And uh, today's uh, talk is part of our Theoretically Speaking uh, series, which reaches mostly to the public and highlights uh, stories and advances of theory of computing uh, for a broad audience. And we're extremely fortunate to have Alvi today. Alvi Ray Smith is our speaker. And I'm going to give you a short description uh, of, what I, um, uh, of the highlight of Alvi's career. What? Myself. You'll brace yourself. Uh, <laughs> he actually uh, uh, got his PhD at Stanford University Computer Science Department, and then he was a computer science professor at NYU and also at Berkeley, working on cellular automata theory, which is where uh, our theory of computing story starts. And from there on, he went on to New York Institute of Technology, where he invented really the first color pixels, followed by a path that led him eventually to Lucasfilm, where he was the t studio's first director of computer graphics. And I think he directed also the first computer-generated animated short film called Adventures of Andre and Wally B, which I understand was sort of a prelude. The previous name was My Dinner with Andre. Yeah, one of the movies that I found very difficult to watch. But in any case, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's a personal thing. And he went on to co-found Pixar, and after that, Altamira Software, which eventually was brought by Microsoft. And I love a quote that I read, actually, in a New York article by Alison Gopnik, where she mentions Alvi, and that when you left New York and went to California, I assume this is a correct uh, quote, you said something, well, something good will happen. And that resonates with me personally, <laughs> the idea of going back from the East Coast to California. And Alvi received the ACM SIGGRAPH uh, Computer Graphics Award, two scientific and engineering awards from the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science, he's a member of NAE, AAAS, and received honorary doctorates from New Mexico State University and New York Institute of Technology. And he's the creator or co-creator of many pieces of computer art, including uh, Sunstone, uh, which is in the New York Museum of Modern Art, uh, published widely, both in theoretical computer science, computer graphics. He's the author of a biography of the pixel. And one of his face first and most famous pieces, as far as I'm concerned, is his drawing of Synapse, which was used as the cover of the Fox proceeding for 41 years. And for those who don't know, uh, Fox stands for Foundations of Computer Science Symposium, and I think it was the one, first conference I've ever want, gone to. And that's the picture on our poster. And I'm delighted to announce that Alvi has generously gifted the Institute with their original artwork for this drawing. And uh, we will be installing this magnificent contribution. Uh, in our institute later this year, so we are deeply um, grateful to you for your generosity. And I know that for you it was like, ah, just take it, but for us it means quite a bit. Um, and speaking of generos generosity, I also, of course, want to thank the Simons Foundation for their ongoing support and for our industry partners, including Algorand, Apple, Google, JP Morgan, NTT Research, VMware Rock 360, and they enable us to do this programming like uh, this evening's event and all our programs. And finally, uh, I want to thank also people who've contributed to our first annual fund, uh, which ended in December. And uh, of course, we are welcoming all the gifts also in the future. You don't have to wait for December. <laughs> so without further ado, please join me in a warmly welcoming Alvi Ray Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Is this working? Is all the sound working? OK. Hi. This is kind of a little different talk than I usually give, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, you can't hear me? Not very well. All right. Are we mic'd up? Should I talk into this guy? That's it. All right. Make sure that the bottom's not muted. Okay. Um, and I can pull this in. Let's see. Looks good to me. That's me. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah. I think can you hear? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. I'm supposed to be able to walk around and you still hear me. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to start off with three tributes. One is to art in general. This is like the oldest piece of art I know right here, human art. It's also animation. Isn't it astonishing that over 20,000 years ago, in Altamira Cave, somebody painted an animated boar? So I used Photoshop to break it into two frames to see how, how good a job they did, and they didn't do too bad. <laughs> now, for the life of me, so I used to think, well, maybe they use a flickering fire to, to, to animate it, but I couldn't make any sense out of that. Let's, I think they just imagined. My second tribute is to my Uncle George in Las Cruces, who no longer with us, but I grew up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, one of my two hometowns in New Mexico, and he, taught, he was a painter. This is his piece, a self-portrait. He taught me how to paint with oils and acrylics when I was a little kid, the only relative he would allow into his art studio if I was set on the floor and remained absolutely silent. <laughs> and it was torture, but I did it. And I learned how to stretch canvas, and I learned to love turpentine and linseed oil and all that, to mix, how to mix paints and stretch canvas and so forth. So I painted pictures for a lot of years, um, basically until I discovered the computer. And my third tribute, it's probably more meaningful than those two, is to the late Martin Davis. Personal friend of my wife, Allison, couldn't make it tonight because of a traffic jam, but Martin Davis and his wife, Virginia, were close friends of, of um, Allison and me. He lived at Bonnie Hill here in Berkeley. And uh, I knew, <laughs> it was sort of my treat when I first moved to Berkeley to, to, to live with Allison, the first day I was here at MSRI, I met Martin Davis. I said, are you the Martin Davis? And he said, who do you mean? I said, computability and unsolvability. And he says, that's me. I said, well, I thought you lived in New York. He said, but I just moved here. So kind of a wonderful welcoming gift to Berkeley was to meet Martin in Virginia. We just lost him, both of them. And, uh, but I learned, and in New Mexico, I, I I'm still kind of astonished. I was at New Mexico State University where I did my undergraduate. Uh, there was a, I took a graduate seminar on Girdle's Incompleteness Theorem. We spent the whole term going through the, the proof. And somewhere in there I stumbled on this book. And so I started learning Turing and the machine and all that. So those are my three tributes. I also mentioned that I got started with theory of computing way back when. In, in early in New Mexico in the 50s. Before I left there, something else happened. I was assigned the job of designing an antenna for the Nimbus weather satellite. That one right there. <laughs> it's, it's a, there's a, there's a cone there you probably can't make out, but there was an equiangular spiral painted on there, and that was the shape of the antenna. And I was the, the old engineers thought they could keep me busy for a month drawing that antenna. And I said, but a computer can do that. And they went, no. And I went, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And sure enough, I got the, you know, I wrote a little program and got the computer to do it overnight and turned it in. So that was my first, that was 1964, my very first computer graphic. And also while I was still at New Mexico State, roaming around in the stacks, I stumbled on this paper. Steps Towards Artificial Intelligence by Marvin Minsky. And I was just enthralled. I said, you mean computers might be a model for this? Wow, what a sexy idea. I want to know more. Where do I go? OK, so Vietnam is, Vietnam War is underway. I have to go to graduate school or I get drafted. So I decided to go to graduate school somewhere where they teach that. <laughs> I found two places, MIT and Stanford. Stanford gave me more money, so that's why I went there. <laughs> now, I had some problems at Stanford. That I won't belabor you with, but it had to do with the length of my hair. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> probably should have. But I stumbled into a, you know one of the. So one of the older professors, let's just put it this way, I won't name him, had a lot of trouble with the length of my hair because I was a full-blown hippie about one year after I arrived in California. And, uh, but two of the younger professors took me under their wing and said, that wasn't fair, what he did you, and they, they guided me through the, the perils of graduate school. 
And one of them was Michael Arbib, probably know him. And uh, I learned, he, he became my PhD advisor. And uh, I wrote my thesis on cellular automata. And I, the, the specialty was, uh, my, my theorem that I was, the theorem I was proudest of was I proved the existence of a self-reproducing, self-reproducing computation universal cellular automata. And uh, that's what this cover is supposed to represent. That my, the concept was mine, but the execution of it is rather poor, and I was disappointed by it. I, didn't do, I did not do the execution of his book. But I did publish it in this proceedings, uh, the ninth Switching and Automata Theory proceedings. And I also published the paper in the next one, or two, two later, the 11th and the 12th also. I'm not going to put that one up. The reason I am showing you this is because of this diagram and the paper I put into the 11th SWAT. It's a real simple proof that a cellular automaton can recognize a palindrome in time equal to its length. It's so trivial, I won't bother you with it. But just remember that space-time diagram because it led right to this. Um, after my first job uh, after Stanford was as an prof assistant professor at NYU in New York City. And uh, just after I arrived there, so you know, I graduated in 69 from Stanford, got my first job immediately at NYU. So about 70, I get my copy of Scientific America. I've been reading it since I was a kid, Martin Gardner's column in particular. And there was this column about the game of life. And I read it and I said, this is my thesis. This is cellular automata theory. He, and Martin Gardner, my hero, doesn't know about it. I'm going to call him. So I did. I, he lived up the Hudson River. I called, called him. And uh, by the way, I should mention, he was an underground hero to the uh, acid generation in San Francisco because of his annotated Alice. It was de rigueur reading by every acid head in, in, in the world, I think. <laughs> and. Uh, so I had two reasons to meet this guy. And uh, I called him up and said, do you know about von Neumann and Ulam and self-reproducing machines and Garden of Eden theorems? And he went, no, I don't know any of this. And it's such a popular subject that the publisher wants to make it the cover story in the February 71 issue. Can I come down and spend time with you and find out what you know? I said, sure, sure. I got to spend a day with my hero, childhood hero. It's just fabulous. And uh, he didn't have a clue about why Annotated Alice was popular. And the, the culture gap was so large, I didn't bother to try to go across and explain it to him. Because the, the rest of the conversation about math was so much fun. All right. He said, OK, Al, he called me. I, I vetted his, his column for him. And then he said, you know what? They want to make this the cover story, so I'm going to submit some Stanislaw Ulam designs, come up with some designs, and submit them. Well, I had just published that theorem in SWAT, recognizing a palindrome in real time with a cellular automata, space-time diagram. So I came up with a, just a colorized version of it, where I chose as my palindrome uh, a, 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 something I had found in the New York Times crossword puzzle a special puzzle devoted to palindromes. The clue was, why don't owls live in the tropics? And the answer is, too hot to hoot. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is a really nice palindrome because it's not only a palindrome, literally, because of the text, but spatially, because the letters are all vertically symmetric. So anyhow, I'll back that off. <laughs> All right, I won the competition for that cover. Why? Because the publisher of the Scientific American was a palindrome freak. <laughs> so, and that's, and I told Shafi this one day, I think, that I, that was the first taste of any kind of fame I'd ever had in my life, as suddenly letters were coming in from all over the world. Now, they were mostly about the game of life, which didn't particularly excite me, but, you know, it, it, I met a lot of interesting people that way. And uh, I started getting, you know, co I had contacts in a lot of different countries all of a sudden. It was, it was a lot of fun. And that led to this. 
because for the, I guess it's the 14th SWAT. By the way, SWAT and Fox are the same thing. We'll, we, it changed names early on. Uh, SWAT, for the 14th SWAT, all right, so I had thought about going to IBM Watson Research Center rather than NYU. Gorgeous place if you've ever, ever been there. It's just an absolutely gorgeous research facility. But I was a young guy and I wanted to live in New York City. So I chose living in New York. But I went up to Watson a lot and hung out with the guys there and we did rock climbing with them and so forth. Eric Wagner and Ernie Rosenberg and uh, Jim Thatcher and I, I can't remember all the names. A lot of people that, that I proved theorems with. And uh, Arnie Rosenberg said, hey, Alvy, we'd like for you to design, he had seen the cover I did for Scientific American, said, we'd like for you to design a cover for our proceedings. I went, okay, that sounded like a good idea. I like making pictures as much as I do math. Um, and this came about one day in, uh, it was a terrible day in New York City. It was deep winter. It was the North Bronx in a, in a blizzard, horrible weather. My car broke down. I pulled into an Esso station. It was just a miserable, it was an ugly Esso station. It, the, it wasn't red, white, and blue. It was red, dirty, gray, and blue. And it was just, you know, it was so ugly and I was so horrified I was going to have to spend hours there when my car got fixed. I said, what can I do to escape this? And I said, design the cover. And while I was sitting there in that horrible situation, this came to me. Not completely, but the idea of the, my hands synapsing onto a cellular automata-like thingy was the basic idea that I had. It took me a month to execute it in India ink on vellum using French curves and straight edges and rapidographs and even an X-Acto knife to, to delineate some of the ink lines. And it got used for the 14th and a whole lot of other. <laughs> In fact, it got used for uh, 38 Fox proceedings. It changed its name, you can see, to Foundations of Computer Science. And, even, and then three more after that. I don't think I have pictures of that. Uh, when it went electronic, and then they finally figured out, oh, we don't need a cover if it's electronic. So, <laughs> so for 41 years it got used. I'm, you know, it's by far my uh, proudest achievement in theoretical computer science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you'll notice that between, let's see, the 15th and the 16th is where it changes name, so early on up there. Um, and then coincidentally, the last one's in 2010. The last one shown is 2010. And the reason I say coincidentally is because that's when I began work on this book that I published last year, or two years ago now. Uh, it took me 10 years to write this book. I started in 2010 and published in 2021. And um, the reason it took so long was every time I touched a subject that I thought I knew and was just going to write it down, I found out, no, I don't know it. And not only that, but the histories have it wrong. And it would take me a year to understand what the history really should be of various technologies and to get it right. I think I do it right. Uh, and then I'll go to the next one and find the same problem. Okay. Um, why did I write this book? Well, because something really amazing happened about the millennium, about the year 2000, and nobody paid any attention. We have been waiting for this to happen for years. It came, it went, nobody paid. It just was accepted. I called it the great digital convergence. When all old media types got swapped out for one, the bit, in the form of the, the bit takes in pictures is pixel. Uh, and I remember we all knew it was coming. The, the videotape was going to go away, film was going to go away, chemical wet stuff was going to go away, ferro ferromagnetic materials are going to go away, pigments, all this stuff are going to go away to be the bit. It happened in 2000, nobody blinked. So I wanted to celebrate that event. That was one purpose of this book. How did we get there? And then the other, other reason for it was 
I realized the pixel is the atom of the new picture universe and nobody knows what a pixel is. I, got, I would ask people what a pixel is, I got all kinds of cockamamie answers. And I realized nobody really knows and it's not that hard. Most, most people think those are pixels. No, they've never been little squares, ever. It's a total misrepresentation. Now it's kind of interesting why people think that's what a pixel should be. If they're stiff and linear and squarish, and maybe people early on at least thought computers were stiff and linear and rigid, and therefore that's what the pixels had to look like. But of course we all know that the com computation in the computer is the most malleable tool that humankind has ever invented. There's nothing keeping it, making its pictures look like that. I think the, I think the, 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 the uh, villain here is the, is the zoom feature. <laughs> really, the zoom feature, every app has a zoom, every device has a zoom, and what does zoom do? It's a quick and dirty trick that made sense back when computers were slow that does the following thing. It replaces, suppose we want to multiply, you know, magnify the screen by 100. What zoom does is replace each pixel with a 100 by 100 square of that copies, of copies of that pixel. So what does it look like? It looks like that. When you look at it, of course, it's just, you're looking at square arrays. But you're not looking at the pixel up close. It should be done away with. It's absolutely false. All right. So what is a pixel? That's, I you know, set out in the book to, to explain it. And uh, without math, by the way, I, I wrote this book for uh, just to do it intuitively. So I, I avoid mathematical terms. I may sneak one in for you guys. Uh, starts with Fourier, French Revolution. That's Fourier on the left. This is probably a more accurate picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> Made contemporaneously. Um, <clears throat> And Napoleon is, is his tyrant on the right. So I kind of came up with this historical theme that seemed to be repeated when it comes to histories of technology. There's a great idea. There's some kind of chaos that drives it to fruition. And there's some tyrant or tyranny that does all the wrong things but somehow helps it happen anyhow. And that's the case here. Fourier was a, well, you know, I grew up in, in double E, we didn't have computer science when I was a kid, so I was a double E, and we learned about Fourier, of course, and I can, knew all about his theory, but I didn't know a thing about him. Do you? He's, he was a French revolutionary. He got thrown in, in jail because he came afoul of Robespierre, and he was slotted to get his head guillotined, and he was saved at the last moment by by Robespierre losing his head instead. And then he went off with his new buddy, Napoleon Bonaparte, who took a bunch of savants to Egypt. <coughs> Fourier was one of the savants, and so Fourier was there when the Rosetta Stone was discovered. And later in his life, he, uh, he mentored Champignon, who cracked the hieroglyphics of Egypt using the Rosetta Stone. He, uh, but he saw, he saw the mistakes that Napoleon made, and military mistakes that Napoleon made. Napoleon got whooped in England. And the last thing that Napoleon wanted was this loudmouth guy in Paris telling people what had actually happened there. So he did the clever thing of making Fourier the governor of a province, the prefect of a prefecture, the one in Grenoble. Fourier knew he was in exile. And in fact, he was there until Napoleon got sent off to St. Helena, Helena. And only then was Fourier allowed into Paris, took over the French Academy, finally got the math straightened out of his great theorem, which he had had plenty of time to work on there in, in the provinces. And uh, this guy, Dirclay, helped him out to get the final, final pieces of math into place. And um, uh, came up with the greenhouse effect, Fourier did. And he championed Sophie Germain, first one of the most outstanding female mathematicians uh, bef before anybody would imagine a woman could, do, could be talented that way. This guy. All right, we all know his theory. You add up 
I just call them waves, sine waves, of course. You add them up, different frequencies, different amplitudes, different phases, how you know, they're adjusted to uh, relative one another, and you get any one-dimensional signal. In the real world, there are some mathematical beasts you can generate that, that violate, violate the theory. But uh, for anything in the real world, like audio, like what we're doing right here, you can add these waves together and get that, get that signal. And it works in 2D as well, multi multiple dimensions, actually. If you extrude these waves away from the screen, you get corrugations. And if you look down on those corrugations, they look like this. And the same thing, if you add up corrugations of different frequencies and different amplitudes, different phases, and different angles, you can get any picture like these, or any of the pictures I'm showing today. You can get a picture of your kid. You, any picture is a sum of corrugations. Kind of surprising in itself, but that's not where the digital world came from. That came from the great sampling theorem. The sampling theorem is sort of the centerpiece of this book, my book, and uh, I want to explain it to people because it's just a piece of magic that makes the whole modern world go round, so, as far as sound and pictures go anyhow. Um, the guy, I was always told that, first I was told that Harry Nyquist did it. No, he didn't. And then I was told Claude Shannon did it. No, he didn't. He never even claimed he did it. Here's the guy that did it. So, you know, this is one of my years. I went out to figure out who did the sampling theorem first. And every country has a candidate. And I went through them all, and I became convinced this was the guy. His name is Vladimir Patelnikov. He's a Russian. He lived through, now you may say, oh, by the way, that's him young when he proved the theorem, and that's him old when he's standing in, in the Kremlin, covered with all the orders of Lenin and Stalin, and they read this and they read that, and I cropped him out of the picture, but Putin is right next to him. <laughs> I got this off of Putin's website. <laughs> He's being knighted, or whatever the equivalent is, in Russia, in the Kremlin, for the sampling theorem on his 70th birthday. And I, I know some Russians here in town, and they swear up and down, oh yeah, he's the guy. How, you Americans never, you, how come you always don't, you don't give him credit? I said, well, I'm going to, I think he did it. All right, let me tell you a little bit about him. His story is so amazing. He, he lived through the Russian Revolution, the Civil War afterwards, both World Wars, the Cold War, and basically all the horrible stuff of Soviet Russia. He, Solzhenitsyn told us about the Gulag archipelago, and he told us about these paradise islands located in the Gulag called Sharashkas by the people who were imprisoned in them. They were the intelligentsia. The idea being if you built a bomber or a bomb or you saw cryptanalysis, you were imprisoned, therefore the secrets were held by Mother Russia. So this guy should have been in a Sharashka. He was the head of the space program, and he, had saw, and he was their cryptanalysis expert. He wasn't. His lab was. It was I didn't know where the Sharashka was located, northern, northern Moscow. Why was he not? Well, because he had a protectress, a woman named Valeria Golubsova, who had her own university. She was first great intellect. But the reason she could keep him out of the camp was because her family was close with Lenin's family, and her husband was Georgi Melenkov, the guy who took over from Stalin, just as bloody as Stalin, and took over directly from him, just as bad. So <laughs> that's what kept him. All right, so wait a minute, we can't give a commie credit for something as important as the sampling theorem, but yeah, we, I think we have to. He did it. There's only, the only closest uh, competitor I could find for was a guy named Whitaker in England, but Whitaker didn't do the entire theorem. For those of you who speak bandpass and lowpass, you got to do both of them to prove the theorem in my book. This guy did it. Okay. Um, what is this theorem? It's a piece of magic. Uh, okay, if you think of a picture as being a rumpled sheet, so 
and you're looking down on to see the picture, where the heights of the rumples are the brightness, color brightnesses of the picture. And you let that sheet settle down onto a bed of nails, sharp nails, regularly spaced nails. Here's what the sampling theorem says. You only have to preserve, to preserve the image, you only have to preserve the samples at the tips of the nails. You go, what? You can throw away that infinity of other points? If you do it right. That's what the sampling theorem says. Apparently you're throwing away an infinity, and I'll show you why it's only apparent. And we have a name for the sample in pictures. They're called pixels. There's the definition. How do you get, how do you get back from the samples to the image that they represent? Well, that paper, Kotelnikov's paper is in the lower right there, and you can see the, what we call the sync function. Everybody calls it that. I don't call it that in my book. I just call it a pixel spreader. Because what the theorem says is, take your samples, put a copy of the spreader function at each sample, adjust its height so it matches the height of the sample, but the width stays constant, add up the results, you've got the image back. So the magic, the, the, the infinity that we seem to have lost is carried in that, that little mountain. This is the two-dimensional version of that, of the sync function. If you, I, I dropped a guillotine through its peak so you can see that it's a peak and, a, and some negative lobes and stuff. Okay. All right. That's the magic of the modern picture world. Pixels, you can't see. If you listen to me, I just told you it's a point can't see a point. So one of the first things I want you to go away with is you can't see pixels. This is full of billions of pixels and you can't see any of them, right? They're all, they're bits in a file. If you want to see one, you ask for it and something happens and there's the picture. What's happened right there? Well, what's happened is a very fast calculation because computers are now fast enough to do it fast. And the little glowy things the little hills or the little glowy things are raised in rows and columns on, the, on your display device. Those aren't pixels, those are display elements. They're analog. They're driven digitally, but they're analog. They have a shape more or less like that, made of light. So those display elements are the, are the, are the, are the pixel spreaders for the pixels that you can't see. Now, if you put that in math form, it just looks hairy as I'll get out. <laughs> all right, so I brought up the next secret of the modern world, as you all know, is the computer. Um, yes, Leibniz did do something about it, and Ada Lovelace did something about it, and Babbage did something about it, but the guy who nailed it was Alan Turing. Just absolutely nailed it. He not only invented the stored program computer, but he showed us the weirdness, weird things that are out there in computation land. The fact that we can't even tell that. I started to say he, he showed us the halting problem. No, he didn't. You know who showed us the halting problem? Martin Davis. <laughs> now, Martin was embarrassed to say that, yeah, he, he knew he had done it first, but he didn't want to take, you know, it was such a trivial modification of the printing problem that Turing did did solve, that he would be, was embarrassed for anybody to say that he did the halting problem in public. But I don't have any problem celebrating my friend. He named and proved the halting problem. All right. Computations are deterministic in the small, but undetermined in the large. And we are just now, I think, in the world starting to encounter just what strangeness that's going to give, lead, lead us to. I'm counting on you for understanding what, how it works. All right, so there was one guy in the world who knew immediately what Turing had done, and it was Johnny von Neumann. He was one smart fellow. He, <laughs> this is how smart he was. He, he happened to hear Gödel present the incompleteness theorem in Gottingen. And he went to him the next day 
and said, I've got an improvement for your theorem. And Gerdel said, no, I've already proved that. Sorry. And, that, and <laughs> von Neumann kind of showing you his personality, I think, didn't do logic any, refused to do any further logic. He got out girdled by girdle. Okay. But I love this picture, which his daughter gave me, because it shows him in a business suit. The only guy in a business suit on a, at the edge of the Grand Canyon with no hat and his mule is while well, he's sitting ass backwards, right, on the edge of the Grand Canyon. But both of these guys, he knew exactly what Turing had done. And he knew, as Turing did, that the only way that, you know, a Turing machine, oh, I should stop and show you something. Where is that? Yeah. For this book, I think I'm going to show you that next slide. Yeah. I designed a universal Turing machine as a business card. <laughs> and I've got a bunch of them up here if you want one later. Okay? It'll compute anything that's computable in the universe. <laughs> Very slowly. <laughs> It'll compute Toy Story, for example, but it might take the lifetime of the universe to do it. <laughs> so he, so these, both these guys understood that, and by the way, I, I said Turing invented the stored program computer. A lot of engineers claim that engineers, no, this guy did it. And I explained it in my book, Chapter 3, which Martin Davis helped me with. Um, there it is. It's program memory, data memory, programming, CPU, it's all there. It was, but it was software and it was awfully slow. But he and von Neumann knew, as nearly everybody does, if you want something in software to go fast, you turn it into hardware. It's just, we all know that. And they rushed off, both of them, to do that. So I came up with two versions of this Turing machine. Here's my, I don't want you to pay attention to the details here, I just want to show you how I present history in my book. It turns out the simple narrative of some genius and does it all, that just doesn't work. It's always a family tree of people who borrow ideas from each other and stab each other in the back and you know, do all <laughs> kinds of, of, of things to, to have the results come out as we know they do. In this case, yeah, Alan Turing is up at the top. On computable numbers, is more importantly, is at the very top. His paper, 1936 paper. And von Neumann's right there because he saw it almost immediately. And uh, everything just sits in there. Right, you, you follow Turing down, you come to the hardware, the, the first computers. And I mean stored program computers, not calculating machines. They don't count. ENIAC, for example, is not a computer. Original ENIAC, it wasn't stored program. There's an ENIAC plus up there. It's a different thing. Von Neumann looked at ENIAC and says, if you add some hardware to this thing, it'll be stored program. And there's an actual, so I celebrate baby. This guy is the first computer. Uh, I was kind of surprised when I wrote this book. I couldn't tell you who had built the first computer. Really? It's been all my life here, and I don't know. And that's because I decided it was just a matter of definition. If you define it to be a stored program computer, it just falls out. One, two, three, four. You can see who did it. And Baby was the first, or perhaps ENIAC Plus. They're fighting. There's a lot of battles, but they're you know they're within two or three weeks or months of each other. They're really close. I just call it a tie. The only thing that Turing worked on was a failure. That he got fired from the job. But von Neumann influenced every other computer up there. All right, so I went to visit Baby for my book. Baby was built in Manchester, England. Uh, it's in a, the Mosi Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. And uh, this is how it greeted me. <laughs> and the word Pixar was scrolling to the right. So the important thing is the first computer, possibly the second, had pixels, and it could animate. Boy, was that a surprise to me. 1947, 48, way before I thought computer graphics had started. Okay. Here's the f actual first picture, first pixels, that the Tom Kilburn, who built Baby, took the first picture. I call it first light, the first digital image. By the way, no little squares, right? Never have been. 
And I found also in Manchester the first game, interactive game. It's uh, checkers. And uh, it's interactive. Again, this is, this is 51. This is w at least a decade earlier than the claims were about the history of computer graphics and interactive computer graphics. All right. This chart, again, don't pay too much attention. I just want you to notice the red arrow at the top. That connects to the previous chart. And I have a bunch of these charts. They just, they're, they're threads that you know, inter interbraid in different ways to generate the modern world. In the, this one, I just want you to look at, I just want to pick, pick out a couple of, see Herb Fried, see the guys saved from the Nazis in the upper right? One of them is Herbert, whoops, sorry. One of them is Herbert Freeman. He was my chairman, my first job at NYU. And much to my amazement, he turned out to be one of the founding fathers of computer graphics. He was saved from the, from the Nazis by Adolf Hitler. No, no, wrong, <laughs> wrong, 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 censor. <laughs> by Albert Einstein himself. Albert Einstein wrote three letters in this kid's behalf, and he managed to get him out of Germany in 39 just in time. And I was working for this guy, and he, he knew I was an artist, and he said, Alfie, why don't you come join us in our computer graphics research? And I said this, I'm still embarrassed, but I said, Herb, if you ever get color, I'm there. It was all black and white then. So I kind of blew off an opportunity that I'm still embarrassed about. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the only thing I really want you to see, time is proceeding down here. I want you to see that just barely there. It says Moore's Law. I don't want to make my Moore's Laws pitch because to me this is, this is one of the most important things in our modern world. Gordon Moore, so we've been talking about what I call Epic One. You see baby in the lower, lower left. This is the period when as the computers got more powerful they got larger and larger and larger until they were several stories tall and they weighed tons and cost today's money billions of dollars and they were really dumb. Really. In today's standards. And then in 65, the year I came to Stanford, just made the picture for the Nimbus weather satellite, Gordon Moore stood up at Intel and said something that was unintelligible to me. So I put it in terms that are intelligible to everybody, I think. He said, you know, the density of components on an integrated circuit chip will double every 18 months or so. But, uh, uh, okay, what's that mean? <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean anything to me until I put it in equivalent terms. So doubling in a year and a half is the same thing almost exactly as an order, a, magnitude, a factor of 10 in five years. And everything good about computers is directly related to the density of components on an integrated circuit chip. So my version, which I think is much more meaningful and helpful, is everything good, anything good about computers gets better by an order of magnitude every, every five years. And I say order of magnitude instead of factor of 10 because we puny humans max out at an order of magnitude. We can't imagine beyond an order of magnitude, or maybe some of us can, but not two orders of magnitude or three. So it's a conception, conceptions change at an order of magnitude. And if you look at that curve, we are now, okay, so Gordon Moore said, he, he only had four data points, and he says, you know, I think this might last for, four, for 10 years. Well, here we are, 11 orders of magnitude away from Gordon Moore. No genius can think that. None of us, none of you, I'm sure some really smart people here, can think 11 orders of magnitude ahead. And we're just, we're, a couple of years from now, we're going to hit uh, 12 orders. What's that feel like? You don't know until we get there. It's like... Like the halting problem, you don't know whether it's going to halt until you get there and find out that it didn't and you still, ask, still are asking. Okay, and by the way, the engineers making those denture chips are riding this same curve. They can't see order of magnitude beyond either. In my lifetime, I've seen the, I've heard the Moore's Law, the death of Moore's Law prophesied four or five times. But every time the engineers say, they get the one order of magnitude, they went, oh, I think I see how we can push it on. Now, we may really have reached there now, reached the limit, but I, I'm skeptical. 
I want to repeat this because this, this is the supernova that has driven the modern digital world, the revolution that we all, everybody here has lived through. And I use the word supernova on purpose. A supernova is a star that explodes and becomes 10 billion times brighter than the original star. And you see I'm talking about an explosion that's already 100 billion times brighter than the original star and headed for a trillion. This is the powerhouse that has driven everything that you and I do. I've surfed this curve my whole life. And I think, I think there, everybody living today will probably do the same thing. Unless it dies. <laughs> All right, what did Moore's Law bring my particular field of computer graphics? It brought us color pixels. They didn't exist. And in 1960, so I went in search of them and I found them. Here they are for my book, I had to find them. I found them, and they happened seven years before I thought they did, on the simulator for the Apollo Moon Project. And I found the two old engineers who'd done it. And we spent a fabulous seven hours together in Salt Lake City until we nailed the actual moment that it happened. And not only was it the first color pixels, but it was the first 3D shaded color graphics. And not only that, but it was in real time, because these were a simulator for NASA. So. Moore's Law, that was one of his first fruits. All right, again, this chart joins to the last one. I don't really want you to spend too much time thinking about it. Let me just, at the very top on the left, there's Rod Ruggelo and Bob Schumacher. Those are the two gentlemen that brought us the color pixels. Okay. Um, I really want to point to this particular braid, threading of all those braids, is the one I know best. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but... If you read across the bottom, you see Toy Story, Ants, and Ice Age across the bottom. All the other movie companies came alive about the same time that we did. And they were just different threadings of these, different braidings of these threads got us there. Okay. All right. This is, this is the paint program at, at Xerox Park. This is where I finally got my color pixels. Uh, I broke my leg in New York skiing, and while I was in this full body cast for three months, I decided that academia wasn't the right thing for me, <laughs> that I was doing, I was not honoring my art, and that the right thing to do, and this shocked my academic colleagues, was to come out of the cast and announce that I was leaving academia and I was going to California where something good would happen. And it was that ill thought. I really did, I just, I just did it. I'm shocked at how lame that thinking was, but I did it. <laughs> and uh, what happened was, came to Berkeley, lived on the floor with Gene Lawler, if some of you may know him, and uh, uh, Hung out with Bob Tarjan. I had room with Bob Tarjan, and you know, I, was, I can't remember where I met all these the Blooms. I met all these people that you all know, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's what kept me, in a sense, kept me part of your community. Although I'm really not, you know, I was doing computer graphics and movies by then, or I, I was on the path that would lead to that. And where it started was right here at Xerox Park. My friend Dick Schaup had built a paint program. Painting, that's me. I looked at it and I said, that's me. It's painting, it's color. And I got myself hired on as fast as I could at Xerox Park. It happened to be the heyday at Xerox Park where the, where the, the desktop computation as we now know it was being invented, mouse and Windows-based UI and laser printer and you know the whole thing and color pixels. But Xerox fired me. <laughs> oh, oh, but I added H, uh, RGB to HSV color transform while I was there. Uh, I couldn't think in RGB. Uh, um, I asked my boss, well, why, why are you firing me? He said, well, we've, we've decided not to do color. I, went, <laughs> I said, what? He <laughs> says, you. You own it. I mean, I didn't know about the NASA guys here, but I thought this was the only color pixels in the world. I said, you own it completely. And that's the future. He says, 
You may be right, Alvy, but we made a corporate decision to go black and white. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> and I, the, we had to find, so my buddy, David DeFrancisco and I, had cast our lots together to, to submit a proposal to the National Endowment for the Arts to, to make art using this new, we called it raster graphics, this new medium, this new way of making pictures. But we needed a frame buffer. We needed a color and pixel memory. And the first one had just been pulled away from me. We had to find the next frame buffer. And we found, the next one hadn't been built yet, but we found out that this rich man on the North Shore of Long Island, not him, but him, at a place called New York Institute of Technology, his name is Alex Shore, the guy on the right, uh, had bought the next frame buffer. And we got ourselves there as fast as we could. And this school is a, this school and this man were amazing. It's all a bunch of mansions on the North, fabulous North Shore, the Great Gatsby part of Long Island. And he had a 100 person old fashioned cell animation team there making Tubby the Tuba. And he thought he could put computers in there and fire all the people. He said, don't say that. No, you can't do that. It doesn't work like that. And anyhow, first thing he did for us was buy us the first 24-bit pixels in the world. I, had, I explained to him, and I don't know where they got it, that if you put three of these 8-bit thingies together, you have a 24-bit thingy. By the way, the 8-bit thingies cost $80,000 each in $75, $1975. And he, I didn't know whether he understood what I said or not. He came, and he, you go from 256 colors to 16 million, and it's, we can do anything with 16 million colors. He came in one night and said, okay, I bought you five more of those 8-bit thingies so you'd have two of those 24-bit thingies. And basically, he put us out in front of the world, but we never looked back. I met Ed Catmull there. He and I invented the Alpha Channel because we could think about, if we had enough memory, we could think about adding a fourth channel without even, it was easy for us to think it. And uh, started making amazing amounts of art. I did this piece called Sunstone there with Ed M. Schwiller. I'm the black-haired guy, by the way. Uh, <laughs> this is sort of the limits of what we could do in 79, just six polygons, texture mapped and anti-alias, but only six. Computers are really slow still. And uh, we decided that this guy was not the guy to pin our wagon to. He, he was, tell me the tuba was terrible. It was a flop. So George Lucas called, said, come join me. And of course we did. We leapt there and waited for George to, and I started hiring all the best guys in the world, and uh, waited for George to come and ask me to be in his next movie. He never came. <laughs> and I realized, oh my God, he doesn't get it. <laughs> and it took Star Trek producers showing up and using Industrial Light and Magic as their special effects house for Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan to get I and my team on the big screen for the first time with a 60 second piece. And this, there's, these are some frames from that piece. Um, but George, oh, that, so that came out in uh, 82. Ed Catmull and I, uh, who would start Pixar together, decided in 83 that we would be the first people in the world, we should announce to the world that we did character animation, not science fiction cowboy stuff. And uh, this is where my, my dinner with, my breakfast with Andre comes in. Um, this is four successive frames from this piece. I just hired a first-rate animator talent named John Lasseter and directed him in this piece. But what I want to show you is we had solved motion blur. We had to solve this. We worked on it for years. We knew if we didn't solve motion blur, we would never be successful because it's another, it's another sampling problem. If you don't sample correctly in time, you get jaggies. You get temporal jaggies. Your pictures jutter across the screen and you can't stand looking at them. Some of the geniuses that I had hired at Lucasfilm solved that problem. And here's our first time out. Uh, and this piece kind of is the holy icon of that time. It's called 1984. It's completely fake. But we had solved everything we needed to solve in order to go big time. And uh, for this book, I realized something else, that we've been 
doing all along, but nobody ever put into words before, is we were honoring the central dogma, what I call the central dogma. We will model inside the computer using 3D Euclidean geometry. We will use Newtonian physics for gravity and optics. And we will take the 3D into 2D using Renaissance perspective. Now, everybody just did that. They didn't even think about it. So, but I came from the artistic world, and we, we're not bound by any of that, and computers aren't bound by any of those three things. So, you know, one of my jobs in the world is to urge artists, please break out of the central dogma and show us what else is out there. And, that, and I use this picture in my book as an example of non-Renaissance uh, non perspective. Uh, you know, because the beams bend here, but they don't in a Renaissance perspective. Um, I think I should start wrapping it up, right? Um, yeah, for questions. Okay. So you have 25 minutes for questions. Yeah, so um, I'll skip over the almost movie we didn't make, <laughs> but it was a movie, uh, it was based on the Monkey King literature of, of Asia that I'm a particular fan of. And I had to back out of it because I sat down and did the numbers right at the last minute and discovered, oh, we need another five years of Moore's Law. We're still shy. <laughs> and right, that was good timing because right at that point, George and Marsha Lucas got divorced. George lost half his fortune overnight. I went to Ed and I said, Ed, we've got to start a company and create a home for these, for these geniuses. George just doesn't have enough money to afford us anymore. Now, this is two nerds talking to each other. We weren't business guys at all. And he, he said, well, what shall, we, what, shall we, what shall the company do? We knew we couldn't do movies because we just had that experiment with the Monkey King that said, you, we need five more years before Moore's Law will be at movie level. Well, well, we had built a hardware machine called the Pixar Image Computer for George. Let's turn that prototype into a product. And that'll make enough money to support our group long enough, we think, for, for Moore's Law to arrive. And that's what we did. Uh, and you know the rest of the story. Toy Story, five years later, right on Moore's Law curve, Disney knocked on our door and said, guys, let's make that movie you always wanted to make. And of course, it was Toy Story. And almost, it was almost exactly at the millennium. It's actually 95, so just shy of the millennium. And then Ants came out from the DreamWorks group and I say it's from the Blue Sky group, also within plus or minus a few years of the millennium. Um, I can talk about the future, but maybe I'll save that for questioning. I think I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Okay. Here. Okay. Well, let's put that up as maybe you'll wonder what that is. You mentioned the story of the tyrants and the innovators. Um, as you've observed computing turn into the internet, where did it go wrong from your perspective? Uh, <clears throat> I'm still watching and observing. I'm not convinced that we can't bring it back under, you know. Uh, I, I, my, my wife and I talk about this a lot. You know, when the, when the printing press first showed up, it was so disruptive. Just horrible stuff was being printed. And, some people say the French Revolution came right out of that. The horrible things that got said about Marie Antoinette, for example. Um, but finally, you know, mechanisms came into play. They're not necessarily in play, but there were mechanisms that came into play of editing and, and, and sel selection by more talented people and where things were presented in a careful way and there was fact checking. You know, there came a way. Now, will the same thing arise for the internet? I don't know, but I still have my hopes there. Uh, I, of course, have been tracking all this. You know, we, back at New York Tech, we had, we had this new thing called email at one point. And we thought it was the most amazing thing in the world. We could write each other letters at different universities. 
and just, and we, it was ours. Nobody else had it. <laughs> and then one day, everybody had it. Damn. <laughs> And that's an awful thing. You know, I can't you know, sort it through email constantly. I hate it. But I have to have it, right? So, um, of course, we're all looking at, well, I guess we all are. I am. Chat GPT and, and the visual equivalent. Uh, let, me, let me show you. Oh, I already took it down. Um, I, I don't know where that's going. I think it's a huge advance. I think it's a lever of some sort that uh, once we've wrapped our heads around it, we'll do amazing things with it and it's going to transform whatever happens from here on out a lot. It's one of those things you could not see before on Moore's Law because you just had to get there. When the computers got big enough and fast enough and the memories are huge enough, you could put everything in the memory and look through it. It took that before Things like ChatGPT could show up. We're just there. It seems like a nightmare right now, but I'm, I'm more optimistic than that, but let's hope it's true. <laughs> let's hope I can be. Uh, <coughs> so to uh, follow up on that a little bit, you know, as uh, Moore's Law continues to improve more and more, um, over here, <laughs> um, oh. Where? Here, here. Oh, there you are, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, well, potentially everything can be virtualized, you know, going to VR, um, you know, very closely related to computer graphics. Um, do you this is VR, by the way. <laughs> really? Okay, so what do you think about VR as our future? Oh, I think we're it's come and gone. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just one of the tools now. Uh, Three or four years ago, I was totally excited about it. And in fact, I am an advisor to a startup company in the Valley called Baobab Studios, a VR company. And uh, I put this picture up here because it's by an old artist friend of mine named Darcy Gerbarg in New York, who's been using my paint program for decades. And to tell you the truth, I didn't much like her stuff <laughs> until she got to VR. She started using a tool called Tilt Brush, where you can paint in three space. These strokes you see here in the foreground are all painted in three space. You choose the color. It, and the paint strokes honor the central dogma. They're, they have width and texture and they cast shadows in each other and all the things that happen in central dogma land. But then she looks at the world, like her studio or her living room, through the sculpture she's painted and digitizes that and brings it into Photoshop and does artistic things to it and gets things like this out of it. And all of a sudden I find myself just sucked into her paintings for the first time and I really like them. And if I've got, she just sent me this picture this morning of another VR painting that she's made and she's looking through it at that picture I just showed you hanging on the wall in her, you know, and she's being shown all over the, all over the world. She's, you know, all of a sudden she's really hot. But that's, that, she was doing that, now we've got chat, she, well, uh, let's call it Dali and that ilk. Stable diffusion. Stable diffusion, or let me show you this one. Uh, this is, uh, damn. Well, one, not, not any that we've mentioned. Mid Journey? Thank you, Mid Journey version four. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't put this up because I think it's good stuff. I put this up because I got it off of Twitter. Somebody just posted it said they had mid-journey, they gave mid-journey the instruction, the US presidents to look like Pixar characters. <laughs> and got this out. And I'm, you know, whatever you think about them, I'm looking at this and saying, even one of those would probably take me a week to execute. And this guy just sat down and, and not only that, so you see the, Top middle is Teddy Roosevelt. He sent ver several variations of Teddy Roosevelt, in which case he'd given extra instructions. Make, throw in a teddy bear in Teddy Roosevelt and Pixar character, and you got sort of a boom, fast. So it's an amplifier. This is an amplifier. And yes, there's going to be lots of garbage comes out of it. But there's lots of garbage that gets painted every day, too. And <laughs> my, some of my artist friends are extremely excited. They said, oh, Alvy, 
You can go through ideas at 90 miles an hour and ever solve your job as an artist, as an editor, a selector, the person who finds the jewel in all the, all the crap and pulls that out and says, take a look at this, folks. So I, I, think, we're, I think we're in, I'm pretty sure we're, we're launched already into a major art explosion because it's all in the hands of individuals now who don't have to have Pixar to back them up. I'm expecting garage bands now to do amazing, to do movies. Because there's, the Unreal Engine came out a few years ago. Well, the Unreal Engine can do in real time what we used to just dream of doing at Lucasfilm, 80 million polygons in a picture. We thought that was the limit. I mean, if we could do 80 million polygons, we were in the right realm of making people happy in the audience. And we would wait 50 hours to get one such picture, real time. Unreal does in real time, does all the lighting and the shadowing and everything. Awesome. Now, I could tell you by Moore's Law that number would get there, but what it actually feels like is a total surprise because I can't see, I can't do that order of magnitude thing. So put, put tools of that kind of leverage into the hands of millions of artists, I think amazing things are going to happen. I know some of the major museums are already gearing up for shows two years from now where they want to show what generative AI does and so forth. Well, let me get that off the screen. Put Darcy's picture back. So one of your slides uh, had uh, uh, billiard balls and they were uh, so realistic, I couldn't tell if they were computer generated uh, they had the reflections of the overhead lights on them. Uh, what was, uh, what's the real story behind those billiard balls? All right, so that's totally fake. Uh, it's modeled, it you follow the central dogma, it's modeled with very simple Euclidean geometry. We're using uh, the motion that Newton would, would say would happen if one ball hits another ball. There's the action reaction stuff. And we've got motion blurs, and we've got the shadows from several light sources all doing the right things. And yes, if you look, if you look at the close-up on the right side of the four ball, you can see a guy holding a pill cue in the window, and there's a palm tree out the door, and there's some beer, beer signs on the walls. You know, once you get there, you can just do anything. But we had to get there. In 1984, it just suddenly, Moore's Law suddenly got there, and we were off and running. Uh, you've mentioned a lot of like Moore's Law as well as things like AI uh, in the last few minutes. How much do you think the kind of future of graphics and computing is dependent on that hardware acceleration or on like software? Do you think it's just the hardware and the software catches up? Or do you think that the software... Oh, I, I think it's the storytellers. I mean, all those things are just tools. It's a storyteller, you know. When I, so, okay, I'm an artist of sorts, you know. Uh, I thought I was an animator and, until I found out I wasn't. And uh, how I found out was Andre and Wally B. I drew the storyboards and I started executing the thing. All of a sudden I realized this is kind of boring. You know, and I, and about that, moment, I met John Lasseter on a visit to Disney, and we found out he was available, and I snapped him up, and he came to work for us, and he said, Alvy, can I make a few suggestions? He looked at my storyboard. Yeah, I said, that's why you're here. Basically, he took over, he took over the animation of Andre and added Wally B to it, and made him cute, and animated, and flexible, and he could, so what does a great animator have that I don't? I can make things move, but I can't convince you that they're alive and conscious and feel pain. Animators can do that. I think they have the same skill as great actors. In fact, I've talked to both groups and they both say I'm right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brian Cox, the star of Succession, I had dinner with him one night. I asked him about this. He said, oh, yeah, that's why I set up an animation studio, animation class in, my, uh, in Dundee, where I'm from. Would you? Give a talk there? I went, yeah, I will. Um, you think about what an actor or actress, an actor or actress does, they convince you that their body is somebody else is completely different from who they really are. And the, if they're good actors, they're totally convincing. 
If they're bad, you pick it up in a moment. Same with animation. If the animator is good, they're absolutely convincing. And if they're bad, you pick up, it just doesn't work. And I, does anybody know how that works? Can you replace an animator or an actor? I don't think so. At least there's no clue how you do it yet. Uh, part of me says, yeah, you, we, this has got to be a machine that works somehow that we can understand. It just has to be. But, you know, back at Stanford when I started AI, you know, by the way, I stopped studying AI after about two years. I said, this is not going to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be wrong there, but maybe not. It's still, you know, things are still kind of, kind of weird. I'm looking to you theory guys to tell me what's out in this weird land of, of uh, you know, where, you know, for most of my career in computers, in programming, we were, weren't allowed to compute on the program. The system wouldn't let you do it. Well, I'm pretty sure that's what these nets are doing, is they're computing on themselves, and now we're off in these really weird spaces that give us GPT and Dolly and so forth. And, oh, I, let me give you an example. My wife and I were in Cambridge, England, on one of her sabbaticals at King's College, Turing's College. Wonderful sabbatical. And my, one of my old buddies walked up to me and he said, hey, Alvy, we don't have to program anymore. I went, what do you mean? He said, read this paper. And he handed me a paper, which happens to be from Berkeley, that I call the Zebra's Horses paper, um, which says, take a GAN, a, a, a neural net of a certain variety, and train it with 1,000 arbitrary pictures of horses and 1,000 arbitrary pictures of zebras, and after it's trained appropriately, you can give it a picture like the one on the top left, uh, and it'll spit out the picture at the top right. It'll replace the zebras with a horse. Sort of horse. <laughs> Unless you look closely. <laughs> or vice versa. You give it an arbitrary horse picture, it'll spit out that horse replaced with a zebra. And I said, well, how does it do that? That's not even a well-posed problem, is it? I, what's a horse? What's a zebra? How do they know? He says, that's what I'm trying to tell you. We don't know how it works. It just does it. And it's too complex to reverse engineer it. That's the part I want you theory guys to figure out. <laughs> What's going on in there? Do, can we get better hold on that strange, uh, the strange, the strange parts of computation theory? Because I think we're there. So um, <clears throat> uh, regarding the, the central dogma, what are some interesting ways that you've seen people break it and some ways in which people haven't broken it yet but you think would be cool to explore? Well, let me just start with painting programs. They don't honor the central dogma at all. You can put it in any color in any picture you want to. That's what painters always have done, just anything they want on the, on the canvas, so to speak. Right. So there's nothing about the central dogma uh, hampering painting. and that's. That's one of the reasons I've had so, back in the early days when I give talks, people would say, Alvy, is your goal to simulate reality? And I went, no, no. Reality is just an interesting subject, you know? Uh, but no, and then I realized, you know, a lot of my colleagues actually are very interested in simulating reality. So I had to kind of tone that down a little bit. <laughs> um, I had another answer for you, let's see. Oh, where's, where it's broken? Uh, so I said all, I don't know whether I said this or not, but all movies that have been made so far uh, are central dogmatic, except one scene in one Pixar movie breaks out of the central dogma. It's Soul. You seen Soul? There's a, there's a pre-island or a pre-location where the souls are before they come to be associated with bodies on Earth. And they wanted to show that that was a different kind of place. And the way they chose to do it was have to, to violate Newtonian physics. So the hidden surfaces don't hide each other. They, they show intersections and, instead of occlusions. Yeah. Kind of worked. It was a, kind of nifty. But that's the only place where they, you know, on purpose they violated it. CAD CAM, 
which is the part of my world, part of computer graphics that is all about the objects, not about pictures. Depends on central dogma. Because their pictures, their things are going to exist in the real world. I think that's why it was such a just assumption by so many people in computer graphics, because a lot of the people in the early days were doing CAD CAM, designing airplanes and cars and so forth. And those things have to work in the real world, so therefore they have to honor the central dogma. Um, I guess that's enough of an answer. A quick one. Hi. Um, where do you see interactivity fitting in with storytelling? I'm not sure about that one. You know, you know at, at Bail Bob, we, you, we had interactive, you know, you put on the goggles and you can interact. And it, you know, I, for years I've heard about, you know, choosing different outcomes depending on interactivity, and they never quite seem to work very well. For one thing, it's really hard to write the screenplay. I mean, one screenplay is hard enough, but if, if you don't quite know which path people are going to take, then it becomes, well, that's why these really successful games have been worked on for years to get all the possible, to have something happen in all the possible uh, branchings. But it's, it's, it's so hard to do. I mean, I guess the, the games are a good example of where, that, where interactivity is everything. And uh, uh, it, 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 it controls gameplay. I'm not a game guy, so, but I, all my grandkids are fanatics, so. Um, thank you for the talk. That was amazing. I was just wondering how you uh, chose your area of um, cellular automaton and your grad school, where if you were yeah, interested in animation before, or like, yeah, you know, what kind of factors? Well, uh, tell you the truth, I thought it had something to do with living things. I mean, just punning on the word cell, cell and cellular. It's, it's not a very good, it's, it doesn't really map on the living things. But that's kind of what inspired von Neumann to write, and Ulam to write their book in the first place, was things floating in a sea of nutrients, and they would come together. And then he decided that cellular automata formalism kind of captured the notion of a sea of nutrients in a controllable way that you could prove theorems about. But in the process of doing that, you kind of lost all touch with real life. Mm -hmm. But I did, I used to sit around and think about, well, if we, maybe I could design an egg that was a cellular automaton that would grow. And uh, as far as I got with that idea was that Stephen Levy put it in as a front uh, quote in one of his books, and that was the end of that. So <laughs> I, I just haven't pursued, I've had a lot of ideas I just didn't pursue, that was one. I still think there's something there. I grew plants using uh, uh, Lindenmeyer systems, which are they're not cellular automata, but they're, they're formal systems that make pictures, and you can grow plants and trees and things. And I was fascinated by Lindemeyer systems for a long time and used them in animations. Uh, hello. Um, so um, I guess currently I'm an undergraduate, and I guess um, I could definitely relate in the um, being both in the artistic and academic field space. Um, my dad's a math professor and I grew up like with um, a strong math background, but I was also like really, really interested in art. So I guess my question is like a little more simpler, but um, I guess, what did you study during your undergraduate um, education and also how did you balance that with your art? And yeah. <laughs> I didn't do a good job. I was a double E, because the double E Got more math than a math major and more physics than a physics major. <laughs> and you could get a job that paid after, you know, I grew up fairly, you know, not real poor, but poorly. And I need to think about things like a job later. And I'm not doing a good job answering this. What I want to say is math and art really are kind of alike in a lot of ways. They're, they're absolutely stunningly gorgeous when you're deep in the heart of both of them. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean. Those of you who prove, prove, prove beautiful theorems know what I mean. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that talk. That was, uh, that was really wonderful. 
Um, one question I had as you were talking, um, you brought up Moore's Law a lot, and you said that there was at least one instance where, uh, I think it was after the, uh, you wanted to make Monkey King, you realized that you need to make, wait five years for Moore's Law to catch up or be realized. And um, it made me wonder whether, like reflecting back, um, whether there were many points in time where you reflected on Moore's Law throughout your career. And um, yeah, I guess if, if you have anything to say. Yeah, uh, Ed Catmull, who's my partner, the co-founder of Pixar, with me, and I used to compute more. You know, we, we, did, we would use Moore's Law all the time to see when are we going to get there. I didn't have my really handy version, the order of magnitude version, until I wrote the book, darn it. But uh, I, could, I could figure it out the old-fashioned way, even though it was painful. Um, and I, you know, I sat down. Monkey was a big disappointment because... I'd gone to China in 1978, and I came back, you know, just after Nixon had been there, basically, and I came back with this many volumes of monkey stories and and artworks. And when this Japanese firm came and said, "We want to make the first movie with you guys, and want to base it on monkey," I said, "Somebody's just grabbed me by the neck." Yes, sir. That's what we'll do. Uh, I'm so disappointed. And we got a long ways. John Laster started drawing sketches of what the monkey character would look like. And it was only after several months that I sat down and said, well, I better figure out what to charge this company. And I sharpened my pencil and pulled in everything. Nobody had ever costed a uh, 3D computer graphics movie before. So I just had to, everything I spent years learning, put a price to it, put a time to it, come up with a reasonable number to charge this company. Assuming that we were there, and I was really dismayed when I found out we weren't. It was going to take three years to compute. That was the killer. You could, they didn't. They couldn't wait three years for anything, and it was going to cost twice as much as it as they could possibly afford. And so I, I bit the bullet, took the loss of face myself, and just said, "We can't do it yet. Sorry." Backed away. Uh, my question was also about Moore's Law and kind of how you like waited five years to make Toy Story until the technology progressed. There was like a clip of like Hayao Miyazaki at CEO Ghibli and he's shown like a CG animation and saying that that's kind of the death of animation and that he prefers hand-drawn. So I was kind of wondering like how you balance um, like advancing technology and also like keeping like the touch of a human artist and like traditional artwork as well? Well, I value it very highly. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of, one of the things that makes me kind of sad with my own technology, this 3D computer graphics is old 2D cell animations just died. And no, that's a beautiful art form. And it, sh it shouldn't die. That should be exploited. In fact, one of the things I didn't tell you about, we, one of the first relationships we had with Disney was to digitize the cell animation process. Ed and I used to go on pilgrimages every year to Disney saying, are you guys ready for us yet? And they would always say no, because they were run by a football player for many years. <laughs> Los Angeles Ram. He married Disney's daughter. That was his qualification. <laughs> and uh, they would always, always say no. They would say, can you boys do bubbles? And we would, that year, no. Can you, next year, can you do smoke? Well, no. You know, they didn't get it. We could do anything sooner or later. Pay for us to get there. And they, they could have had us for nothing. And they ended up paying $7 billion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get it, you know. <laughs> so I think we're kind of coming to the end of the talk. I actually have a question. Uh, you know, you spent a lot of time uh, beautifully sort of showing the history in the sense of where is the first place that something was invented? You know, the software, the hardware, and so forth. But, uh, you know, one of the things that's happening um, is that an artist is using these programs. In what's, who, who's, whose is it? Do they own it anymore? Or are they the first? Uh, what do you, what do you think well, I, I've actually thought about this for many years. And uh, remember the picture I showed you of the first RGB pictures? The guy who bought us the, you know, basically paid $2 million on my say-so to get us enough memory to make RGB. Um, damn, I lost my track there. 
So what, Mike, you, like, who's, who's the one? Who, who's the artist? Okay. <laughs> now I've got it. Okay, see the upper right picture? Yeah. It's my piece, but it's made from the UFOs by Jim Blinn. Uh, David DeFrancisco took the photograph of Stonehenge that I used. Paul Zander was a painter that used my paint program to paint the clouds and the grasses. Uh, Lance Williams contributed the uh, chrome piece. Another guy wrote the function generator that I used for the streaked glass. I put it all together. It's my piece. I call it a one-frame movie. I called it back then. I called it a one-frame movie. If I give credits for this thing, it's like a movie. you got to list off every machine you use and every artist and their contribution. But there's no doubt in my mind or any of my colleagues that this is my piece. I was the one that arranged it and got the pieces together. I directed this one-frame movie. It's my piece. And I think we're going to start applying that idea again. Thank you. And thank you so much for an amazing talk. Thank you.